Divya Sasi Dharan. I am a web developer. I work at the Night Lab, which is a media and innovation lab that's associated with Northwestern University. Um, we're going to be talking about the problem of how browsers currently run, render state. Then we're going to dive into how browsers actually render and how that works. Um, then we'll talk about virtual DOM, which is the meat and potatoes of this talk, and why virtual DOM is a compelling way of how we can render state on the browser. So the problem of how browsers render state. So I'd like to start with an analogy using emoji. Um, so imagine if you spilt coffee on your pants. Would you just change out of your pants, or would you change out of your entire outfit? <laughs> Wait, did someone say change out of your entire outfit? You gotta okay. What was that? You gotta sure, sure. But for this specific example, we're just gonna change out of our pants. And we're going to assume we have like multiple like versions of that pants or whatever. It's 1.5 or whatever. Um, and so if we take that example and we adapt it to the browser, the browser also has two options when it comes to rendering. It can refresh the entire page, which is what happened you know, like long in the past when updates happen. Or we can just refresh parts of the page and update pieces that need changes. So again, like the previous analogy, we're not going to think about coordination. We're assuming that is default. But we're going to just refresh, uh, I mean, reshuffle parts of the page that need to be updated. So the basic task we're focusing on is mapping the internal state of an application to the screen so that it's made visible. Um, and it's pretty clear. It's a pretty straightforward process. The inputs and outputs are very obvious. Um, to better grasp that process of how it moves from state to screen, let's look into this process of how browsers do that. So on initial load, we get an HTML document, which gets parsed, and that gets transferred to the DOM tree. Meanwhile, we have CSS. That gets parsed. And we get style rules, which then connect it to the DOM tree, which, render, which creates a render tree. And that spins off a layout process. And that layout process spins out a paint, which is what we see on the screen. And that's, in essence, the overall picture of what the process looks like from download to view. From a low-level perspective, this is how a render tree gets created. A DOM tree is connect connected with the CSS object model to create a render tree. And a render tree, all you have to understand about that is its nodes that are visible on a screen. So because we see the body and the div, those are the two things that you see on a screen um, with the time of 345 and a color. So that's the render tree. And again, a quick recap for those of you who are unfamiliar. A reflow is an event as a result of changes that affect the layout of a page. To drill that down a little bit, we have the same element, div tag, with a time of 345 PM, and the style is a color of black. So a reflow is when we change that text content from 345 to 346. Because there's a text change, it causes a reflow of the page. A repaint, on the other hand, is an event as a result of changes that affect the visibility of a particular thing. So here we have the same example, but if we change the color from black to red, that causes a reflow and not a repaint. Anything that touches the render tree can spin off a repaint and a reflow. Um, and as many of us are acutely aware of, this is a commonly notorious performance bottleneck. And if we compare the two, reflows are generally more guilty of this, more so than repaints, because reflows cause a layout change which can affect other elements on a page, whereas a repaint usually is isolated to a specific element. So I want you to think in that context as we move through this talk. So to nail that down in a concrete example, we are using that very, very popular time example where we're displaying a ticking clock on a page. So we have a span element with a class of clock. And in a set interval loop, we're just writing directly to that DOM element. And this is like very vanilla JavaScript. We're not even using jQuery. Um, and so 
This is super trivial, and there's nothing wrong with this example of writing directly to the DOM. When our app becomes more complex, writing directly to the DOM becomes more performance intense. Um, and we'll look at another example to show, to show you a little bit of that. So we're going to use an example of filtering a bunch of Marvel superheroes. Um, and in this case, it's only like six of them. And I'm splitting them based on the, uni the cinematic universe they belong to. So they can be in, the, Mar in the, the Netflix original series or they're in movies. So you can filter them using input, like very basic input radio buttons where all corresponds to all superheroes. Movie corresponds to only those that are in movies. So if, if you're familiar, it's Iron Man and Thor, really. And then the other three are from Netflix series. So we associate those input elements to those specific um, like superheroes. So in vanilla JavaScript, there's, there's like multiple approaches that you can take to this. You can change the opacity of the list element. So instead of realigning it, you just make it opacity 0 or 1 based on whether it fits the criteria. Or you can basically create, um, like change the, prop, change the layout of it so you're moving elements in and out and realigning the list for each criteria. So comparing those two approaches, one is the reflow and repaint is where you're realigning the list. The repaint is where you're just changing opacity. And if you look at the difference, you'll you can see that repainting is much faster than reflowing and repaint, and for obvious reasons. So if you think about this and you scale it to a larger application, you can see that um, reflowing and repainting a page is extremely performance intensive. Um, another very popular way of how we render things to, to the DOM is through the MVC structure, where we map models to views directly. And it's a more streamlined way because there is this separation of concerns. Instead of us writing our business logic directly into our UIs, we're separating them into two. So our views live in templates, and then our models and, and controllers live separately. Um, and this is really nice, because we can componentize things. And so state is specific to a component. So if we look back to our example of the clock, I'm using Knockout.js just because um, I think it's fairly clean. Like, I don't want to talk about controllers so much, so it's purely models and views in Knockout. Um, and so in Knockout, it's pretty much the same thing. You use an observable for time, and that observable changes for each set interval loop. It's not much different than doing it directly in vanilla JavaScript. But if you compare the time, there's like a slight difference in terms of how Knockout works. It's like a tiny bit faster than vanilla JavaScript in terms of rendering. Um, and if we use that same um, filtering example, you see that there is a huge difference between Knockout and vanilla JavaScript in terms of filtering. So you can kind of tell that MVCs have optimizations inbuilt into them that allow for rendering performance. The problem, though, with MVCs is that state tends to have to be passed through components. And if you think about it, this is what we end up, we end up building when we mix models and views together, because we want one piece of an event to be passed through from one model to another view or multiple views. So it ends up being very cluttered and complex and very difficult to manage over time. And after all, we're developers. We want to have our cake eat it too. We want to be able to render for performance as well as being able to maintain apps in a very easy to manage way. And thankfully for us, virtual DOM comes in as a way of optimizing for render performance without us having to really think too much about it. Most of us have already been using it. It's in React and a lot of frameworks and current frameworks. Um, but we're going to dive into the implementation details a little bit. So, the virtual DOM is purely an abstraction. So if you understand, we talked a little bit about the DOM. A virtual DOM is just a layer on top of the DOM. So if you think of the DOM as, an, as a bunch of like JavaScript objects, that's pretty much it. It's, there's not much more to it. The inner workings of it that makes virtual DOM super compelling is that it essentially, for every state change that happens, it creates a new object of the DOM, or a new representation of the DOM. 
So you see that the above is the old DOM tree and the bottom one's the new DOM tree. It diffs the two and then it outputs that difference directly to the DOM. And of course, the common question is that this seems pretty slow because after all, we're having to diff the, diff the DOM each time. We're having two separate like, representations of the DOM in memory, which seems really, really slow. But um, the concept of virtual DOM is actually not specific to, to the web um, or to our industry. This is a slide from Pete Hunt's talk um, that he gave at FutureJS in 2014. And he compares the virtual DOM specifically for React with the Doom 3 game engine. And if you're really interested in it, the slides will be posted so you can go into detail of that. And there's a link to his talk, which is wonderful. If you're still not convinced, and if that, that wasn't enough, um, let's go into detail and look at some numbers. So we're going to return to our same example of like filtering this list. This is just so that you can remember what that looks like. Um, and implementing it in virtual DOM is like 25% faster at rendering time and almost 50% faster in paint time when you compare it to the vanilla JS example. Um, and it's the same if you, if you compare it to the knockout example. It's way faster because the optimizations in terms of rendering is much better than in traditional MVC frameworks. So let's dive into how exactly it works. So for this specific example, or for this ex explanation of virtual DOM, I'm using Matt Esch's library. If you're familiar, it's like a very vanilla virtual DOM e example. And so using that, I hope that you can get a sense of like the different stages that virtual DOM goes through to do that diffing and rendering. So first, um, we have to create a render function. And the render function is just kind of explaining your HTML structure in a JavaScript object, like object model. So it kind of looks a little confusing, but the way virtual DOM works is that you have to give it a node. The node is just um, like a tag. So you can give it a div, you can give it a span, and so on. And a text is the specific content that is within that. So, so currently, the span with a class name of clock is the parent element. And then the virtual DOM vtex time is the child. Because every time when you think about it, even though we tend to think in tags, content is also technically part of that object model, or it's a child of the tag that it's in. So that's what creates the um, structure of it. So you call render with the time, and that creates like a virtual object, essentially. And unfortunately, you can't append this directly to the DOM. So the next step is to create that or convert that JavaScript object to a bunch of nodes that you can then append to a DOM. And so we append it to the document.body, and then we successfully have time, which is 12.45 PM. And what is, what is missing here is that it's static. So it doesn't work now because there's no like loop. It's not updating. So let's change that. So we're going to use set interval again. Um, and this time, we're going to pass it in a new date. So the set interval updates for every 1,000 milliseconds. Um, and so we pass in that new date. And then we create a new virtual tree, so a new JavaScript object. And then we patch that difference, calling virtual DOM.diff, which does that specific diff. And then we write that patch directly to, um, so root node is basically like it patches it directly to the DOM. And then you have to update the virtual tree, because if you don't update the virtual tree, it won't update as updates happen, if that makes sense. Cool. So uh, the main concept in virtual DOM that's, that makes super compelling is the diff. And a diff is just comparing a previous version of a tree to the current version of the tree, and it identifies changes between the two. So it kind of looks like this. You have an old tree and a new tree, and you're just doing a layer by layer comparison. So it compares nodes with nodes directly. And that's because most changes that happen in our web apps are very lateral. We change things at the same level and want them to be similar. So common um, DOM updates are appends, remove, and changing nodes. To append a node in virtual DOM, you would 
have an old tree and then a new tree, and as it does that lateral comparison, it notices that the first tree is three levels deep and the second tree is four levels deep. And because there is a discrepancy in the, in the number of levels, it's able to append that change and patch that directly to the DOM. Removing a node is pretty much the same. Here, except there are three levels on each. So what virtual DOM does in addition is it checks the number of children at every level. So the first level has one child each, second level, two children, third level, there's two and one. So that discrepancy, again, gets patched directly to the DOM. Changing a node is slightly different. Um, in this specific example, those two use cases are covered. So the additional step that virtual DOM does is a type check. So it checks for type for every node. So here, the, on the third level, the second most node, the type changed. And because of that, it's able to identify that property and update that property appropriately. Um, all of these examples I explained were fairly trivial, if you didn't notice. <laughs> they all happened in order. They were all at the bottom of the tree. So this is like, it's nice to think about, but at the same time, it's like, in a naive implementation. I mean, there are times where we want to update things in the middle of the tree. It's not always at the bottom. So how does virtual DOM do that? So we have, let's say, our, we'll go back to our superheroes example with a slight difference. Here we have just Marvel Netflix original series, and we forgot Iron Fist image. It wasn't that good, but <laughs> we, so the P tag is there, but the image tag is not. So we noticed that, and we need to change that appropriately. So if you look at it from a DOM tree perspective, there is a huge difference, except for the fact that if it does that level by level comparison that I mentioned earlier, that P will not match that image, and that blank will not match that P, which means that virtual DOM will just update that entire, all of the children, which we don't want because that's not optimized. We don't, especially if you think about a deeply nested tree, and if you update a property or, or if you update one node in it and it doesn't match level by level, that's a lot of children and a lot of reflows and repaints that are happening. So thankfully, virtual DOM has this concept of keys, and keys are just a way that you can kind of pass in extra information to the nodes that you give it and that gives it specificity. So, in, so while it does a level-by-level level comparison, it also remembers and is able to match keys with keys. Um, in, in some sense, the Matt Ash version of Virtual DOM, you don't have to pass in keys per se, because it has like an ID comparison internally, but if you want it to be more explicit, you could easily pass these in. And so when it does that tree comparison, it just is able to identify that image was added, and it won't even touch that paragraph element. So with all of this, I hope virtual DOM is pretty compelling, but there's like additional things that I'd like to cover so that you know, you'll have an understanding of why it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. So virtual DOM is state manager agnostic. What I mean by that is it's purely for rendering. So in a sense, we use set interval in all of our examples, um, but you can use object.observe, you can use observables in MobX or Redux, you can use Ajax. The most popular um, that React uses actually is request animation frame. Instead of updating for every state change, it updates at certain points, so it batches it appropriately. But you as a developer can make that decision if you use virtual DOM like in its vanilla version. It's also browser independent which is pretty great because our endpoints are not necessarily always the same browser. Um, and also, we can port it to various endpoints. So if we want to write a native application that has the same content as our web application, that works with virtual DOM. It also works if our endpoint, we want to use um, web workers. It works pretty well for that. Because after all, it's just a bunch of JavaScript objects. For those of us who work with the front end, we're all familiar with how difficult it is to test front end because we'll have to use PhantomJS and Selenium and then maybe some virtual diffing to see what changed when we make a new deploy. But because virtual DOM is a bunch of JavaScript objects, we can just do type checks and we can do equality checks super easily to see where things changed and whether things render the way that we expect them to render.
So I hope with all of these, virtual DOM is a very compelling option to you um, and that you'll, you'll use it in your future applications. Thank you.